Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Ellie Richardson, the kids librarian from the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. Welcome to our virtual Beyond the Birds and Bees program. Let's get started and welcome Dr. Heidi Crowett. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Ellie, for the introduction. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just reiterate um, that I am so excited to be here. Last week, I got to do a little virtual chat with parents of preschool and kindergartners, and we just had such a good time. We learned a lot. People had really great questions, and I really enjoyed getting to know some of the people that were in the room. So I have no doubt that tonight's going to be just as wonderful. I want to just make a couple comments before I really get started. Um, so when I talk with parents, I really am talking with parents. So a lot of what I'll talk about, I'll use um, words that are really kind of medically appropriate. We'll talk about a content that is meant for adults. And so I just want to remind you that if you do have kids in the room, there might be times that you might want to just, you know, mute your whole computer if you don't want them to hear some of these things. My job is to help parents feel more equipped talking to their kids about their bodies and sex and sexuality. And so I want you to be able to go and talk with your kids about it. I don't need them to hear me talk about it, right? So I always just say that, just reminder uh, that I do use a lot of words and we talk a lot about stories. And if you don't want your kids to be hearing those things, um, you might just wanna kind of keep that in mind. And uh, like Ellie said, I am happy to take questions. So if you have questions as I'm going, you can certainly throw them in the chat. You can send them to me directly. Um, you can just put them generally if you want and I'll kind of answer them as they come. Otherwise, at the end, I'm going to open it up for questions for everybody. And that is where if you sent them personally to um, Ellie, she'll be able to read them for us and we can get through them. All right, I am so excited to have you all here. Let me just give you a little bit of background on who I am and what I do. If you were not here with us last week, um, I just want you to kind of know why I was invited to do this. So first and foremost, this is my job. This is what I get to do. I am um, a communications professor by day. That's sort of the, you know, like the easy version of my job when people ask what I do for a living. I can say I'm a professor and no one asks questions. But if I'm at like a really cool dinner party and people want to know more, then I get to get into all the good stuff. And I say, okay, but actually here's what makes my job fun. That in my role as a professor, I do research. And the research that I have been doing for almost 20 years now is on how families communicate about sex. And that research that I've been doing, really, I brought it all together and created this program called Beyond Birds and Bees. And I've been delivering this program to parents now for about 15 years, obviously updating it and revising it as we learn more information and as um, our culture changes, as the research changes. And my goal is always to bring parents really good information, information that is often stuck in not even like normal good libraries, but like academic libraries at universities, right? Where like most parents just have no time to go and spend a Saturday morning. So my job is to take all of the research, dig through it, talk to the experts, attend the conferences, read all of the books and do all of the things so that I can present parents with information that feels real, that it's in real time for the things that you're really going through and that it's fact, uh, factual or research-based, but that also leaves room for you and your family to incorporate your family values. That's really important to me, that families know that you have values around sex and sexuality. My guess is that most of you do. And sometimes we don't know how to articulate those values. We don't really know what they are. As we are raising kids, we do know that we often have behavioral expectations for our kids. Right? So I hear from a lot of parents that they say, I don't know, I just don't want my kids to have sex yet. And now obviously we're talking about young kids here today. I don't think any of you are really worried that your kids are having sex in this age group. But at some point you might think, I don't know what else, I just don't want them having sex. And I think, okay, great. That's a great starting point. That's a behavioral expectation. But then we wanna be thinking about what the values are that are attached to that. Why don't we think that they're ready? What are you hoping for, for their relationships and their, their future sexuality, right? And so then we start to think about those values. And that can be really tricky because I think that we live in a world where there's just a lot of behavioral expectations put on us and our kids. And sometimes we don't always know why or what the real value is there. And so one of my uh, kind of important priorities is to help parents mix and find a balance between the research and your values. And hopefully we'll get a chance to do some of that tonight. 
So I get to talk to parents all over. I, uh, this is my favorite part of my job is doing presentations with parents. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about expanding your idea of what it means to talk to your kids about sex. I'm going to share with you some um, helpful categories for developmentally where your kids are at to help us understand developmentally, what are they ready for? We're talking tonight with parents of like first through third graders. And so in this age group, what are they developmentally ready to know? How do we initiate some of these conversations? Uh, how do we answer some of the common questions that our kids have? And then at the end, I'm gonna save time for the common questions that you might have. I want you to leave here tonight feeling like you've got your questions answered, that you have um, a little bit more information to help you feel more comfortable and confident in managing this conversation with your kids. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what it means to really talk to our kids about sex. Well, again, if you happened to be here last week, you heard me say this, but I want parents to, instead of thinking of like a to-do list item, like I have to talk to my kids about sex and I'm gonna check it off my to-do list at some point, right? Rather than thinking about it as like a task that you have to do, I want us to think about it more as raising sexually healthy kids. That we're not just telling our kids what sex is and that they shouldn't be doing it, right? But we want to be talking to our kids about overall, what does it mean to be sexually healthy? And we want to be raising kids who are sexually healthy. So what does that mean? You're going to hear me say that phrase sexually healthy over and over tonight. So let's break that down. Well, first and foremost, sexually healthy kids grow up to be sexually healthy adolescents who grow up to be sexually healthy adults. So the goal, right, is that someday we have raised our kids who have grown up to be these adults who may be in some kind of virtual space, whatever that looks like at that point, right? But that they're in some room someday as an adult and that they feel really good about the sexual choices they've made, the sexual decisions they've made. They feel really comfortable with the role that sex and sexuality has played in their life. And they feel really good about what they know and how they've experienced sexuality. That's what we want for our kids, right? I know it's hard to think about when they're nine, right? I know that it's hard to think about when you've got these young kids and you think, well, okay, Heidi, but that's like jumping way far ahead. I know, but that's what it is with all of parenting, right? All of the things that we're doing with our kids when they're young is to help them grow up to be these healthy and happy and uh, independent, right? And engaged citizens of the world, right? We want them to be these healthy, happy adults just like we want them to be these sexually healthy adults. And so just like the work to raise engaged citizens of the world starts now when they're young, right? So does our work in raising sexually healthy kids. And a lot of this work you're already doing. So let's talk about some of that, right? A lot of what it means to raise sexually healthy kids, you're already doing some of that. So for example, sexually healthy kids, they know and understand their bodies. Sexually healthy kids know what their bodies are for, what they're not for, why their bodies do what they do. And at this point, I'm guessing that a lot of you have had conversations with your kids about certain aspects of their body, why it does what it does, or they've had questions about it. We are going to talk tonight about a lot of that. How do we really have those conversations? What should we be telling them and how much? But sexually healthy kids know and understand their bodies. Sexually healthy kids also can appreciate their bodies. This is one that I think is a little bit trickier for us, right? Because I always joke, like, I am not naive enough to think that we are going to raise a whole generation of kids who are like, yes, I love what my body is doing during puberty and this is amazing, right? We're not naive enough to think that we're going to raise our daughters to get their first periods and just go, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened. I am so excited that this is going to happen to me like every month for the rest of my life, basically, right? I know we're not gonna raise girls who really think that all of the time. But I also know that a lot of us women were girls who never told anyone we got our first periods, never felt good about our bodies, especially when it came time for puberty and adolescence and menstruation. I know a lot of us have questions about what periods were and how it worked. And I think that we can imagine raising a generation of girls who know what their bodies are doing, know why their bodies are doing it. And yes, of course, it's going to feel uncomfortable at times. And of course they can think it feels weird or gross, but they can also think it's pretty cool what my body is doing. It's pretty amazing that my body is doing this all by itself. 
I didn't have to tell my body to do this. It just did it. And when we put it into the context of the bigger picture of why our bodies are doing that, I think that that's part of how we raise kids to appreciate their bodies. That even though it doesn't always feel good in the time, right, during puberty, there is a greater purpose involved. All right, so sexually healthy kids, they know and understand their bodies, they can appreciate their bodies. Sexually healthy kids can also show love and intimacy in a variety of ways. This is something I think as sexually healthy adults, we probably are pretty good at, right? You all know that you show love differently to your kids than you do your partner, than you do your parents, than you do your best friend. You know that there's a lot of ways that you can show love. We have to teach that to our kids. We have to teach them that they don't have to greet everybody the same way, right? Sometimes you might hug somebody because you want to. Sometimes you might just wave, right? Sometimes you might high five somebody. Sometimes uh, maybe you will run up and give someone a really big hug and kiss, right? We share with our kids that there are a lot of ways to show love and to be intimate. That's something that you're likely already doing with your kids. And that's a really important part of raising sexually healthy kids. Because remember when you were talking about this kind of progression, sexually healthy kids grow up to be sexually healthy adolescents who grow up to be sexually healthy adults. Well, think back to that time of being an adolescent. Think back on maybe your own teenage years and think about, we were sent a lot of mixed messages and very confusing messages about how to show love or how to be intimate. In fact, a lot of us were kind of under this impression that like there were really only a couple ways to be intimate with people. You might have looked around and seen that your friends who were in romantic relationships, if they were showing love or they were being intimate, that it really only looked like a couple different things. We were also kind of, I always am like baffled by this, and yet I grew up in the same kind of environment, but I'm baffled by, by it now. We were also taught that there was like this progression of behaviors that once you did that behavior, you couldn't go back, right? There was like all these progressions of things. And you might've said, this is my line. I am not crossing this line. Okay. And then let's say you cross that line. Then it's like the line just disappeared. And you're like, well, I guess now this is my new line. Okay. So what happens if you cross that line, then that line disappears. And now this is your new. And I think that actually doesn't make any sense. There's no reason why if you crossed your line, you can't just say, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. And you can say, I'm going to go back and I'm going to have this be my line. That's my boundary. Just because we engaged in a behavior that maybe one time we said we weren't going to engage in did not mean that we forevermore in every other relationship had to engage in that behavior. Just because we were in love with somebody or we were intimate with somebody in one way does not mean that in every other relationship we had to show love or be intimate in that same way. And I think a lot of us lived in a world where that felt very true. It felt like we couldn't go back. So when we're talking about raising sexually healthy kids, we're talking about what can we do for them now when they're young to help them understand that as they get older, they have a say in how they show love and how they are intimate with people. And they can make changes to their decisions. If they made a choice to do this one day, they can say the next day, I don't want to do that anymore. And we can teach them, right? And part of that starts now when they're young. It teaches them that they don't, it's when we teach them that they don't have to give everybody a hug who gave them a birthday present, right? It's that every family member who comes over for a holiday, you don't have to go and sit on their lap and give them a hug, right? There are other ways we can show those people that we care, other ways that we can be intimate and affectionate. We just have to teach our kids some of that. So sexually healthy kids, they know and understand their bodies, they appreciate their bodies, they can express love and intimacy in a variety of ways. Sexually healthy kids can also practice effective decision-making. What does that mean? I think that's another one that as sexually healthy adults, we probably are pretty good at, although I'm often quite terrible at making decisions, uh, like where to go out for dinner. That's a hard one for me. Um, but right, when you think about teaching our kids to make decisions, that's another one that when they're adolescents is going to be really important. Again, think back to your own teenage years. Think about let's take it out of that realm of sexuality for a moment, right? And let's think about you were at a party and maybe you had decided you weren't going to drink alcohol when you might have known people there might be drinking, but you had said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be drinking. And then you get there and everyone around you maybe is drinking and they seem fine. Maybe you were under the impression that it was like, if people were drinking, they were going to get really drunk and act really crazy and they were going to be ridiculous or they would be in trouble or the whole place was going to get arrested or they were all going to get, you know, sent home. And you looked around and you might have thought, it doesn't look so bad here. 
So then when somebody offered you that drink and they said, well, Heidi, why don't you want to have a drink? You certainly weren't going to say, um, because my mom said no, right? My mom told me I shouldn't have a drink. That's not what you're going to say. So for a lot of us in our teenage years, we were never taught what to say, how to say it. Our parents said, don't do these things. And we said, okay. But then when we were put in those situations, we didn't always know how to communicate about it. We didn't always know how to say, I don't want to do that because I don't want to. I don't want to do that because I don't think it's the right thing to do. And here's why, and here's how I can get myself out of that situation. So we're talking about raising a generation of kids who, when they get into those situations, they know what decision they want to make. It's their decision to make, and they know how to follow through with that decision. Kids are far more likely to follow through with a decision if it is their decision. You know this, right? Because all day long, we can tell our kids to do something and they won't do it. And then they make up their minds to do it. And suddenly it's like the greatest decision that's ever been made. And you think, wait a second, didn't I just suggest that you do this a minute ago? It doesn't seem to matter, right? If it's their decision, they like it. Well, so how do we do that when it comes to things that we might know more about when it comes to drinking or drugs or smoking or sexuality? And we think about our sexual behavior and we think, I have so much I want to tell my kids and I want them to not engage in risky behaviors and I want them to be safe and I want them to be healthy and happy. But that's not going to come from us just telling them these things. That's rather going to come from us thinking about raising sexually healthy kids who are equipped to make their own decisions. So how do we do that now when they're young? Well, it starts with some of the things that you're already doing. It starts by giving them a lot of opportunities to practice effective decision-making. It starts by giving them opportunities to make mistakes and then to talk through why that mistake happened and what they could do differently next time. I always share this example with people. It was just, it was obviously like a pivotal moment in my own parenting. I have, by the way, a 10 year old and a 13 year old. So I feel very close and connected with parents that I talk to, um, especially in this age group. I think, oh, we just kind of left this age group. It's very uh, fresh in my mind. But I think back to when my daughter was in kindergarten and I remember there was this day that she was wearing this dress to school. She wanted to wear this skirt because it was like really like uh, kind of flowy and it like spun around and she just loved it. And I remember it was a cold day and I had said, well, you need to wear leggings under that dress. They're not going to let you out at recess. It's too cold. And I know for sure I was not being my most patient self, uh, right? I'm sure we were like two minutes away from the bus coming. And I was like, oh my goodness, just put on pants and let's go, right? But I remember that she was refusing. She did not want to wear these pants. And so I remember I threw the leggings in her backpack and I said, well, they're there if you need them, goodbye, right? And I sent her on her way. Okay. So then she came home from school today, that day and she was wearing the leggings. And it was like everything I could do, by the way, not to be like, ha, I told you so, like you were going to need those. Okay, but I didn't, right? So instead I waited till that night. She had come home with the leggings, had the leggings on, and we were getting ready for the next day. We were getting ready for bed and getting ready for the next day. And I said, hey, I noticed that you came home from school today wearing those leggings. Tell me about it. And she said, again, as if we had not thought about it that morning, she said, oh, oh yeah, they said I couldn't go outside for recess because they didn't have any pants on. And then I knew I had leggings in there, so I put them on. Again, my idea, right? But no, I'm not going to get any credit for that. But instead, here's what we did. So then I said, okay. Great. Well, what do you think you're going to wear tomorrow? So she asked Alexa, because we ask Alexa everything in our house, right? So she said, Alexa, what's the weather tomorrow? And found out that the weather the next day was going to be the same as it was that day. And so she went and she picked out a pair of pants to wear to school. Now, I know that you might be thinking like, this is the most ridiculous story, Heidi. Um, yes, but this is a very real parenting story. And you, I'm guessing, are relating in some way. These are the things that in our daily lives we are experiencing with our kids. And it was an opportunity that I had to sit with my daughter and watch her make a decision that I knew was not going to go the way she wanted. I could have fought and forced her to wear them, but I knew that wasn't going to work. So I right threw the leggings in her backpack. Then later that day, we could have fought about it again because I could have insisted that she knew I was right. But she learned a lesson, right? She learned that the lesson was, I need to think about what the weather is going to be before I pick out my clothes. Again. I realize that that is a trivial lesson, but that is such a great example. And it sticks out in my mind as a time where I think that's how we practice effective decision making. That was a really low risk place for her to practice that. She wasn't going to get into trouble. She wasn't going to get in and, you know, get hurt in any way. But it was an opportunity for her to see that a choice she made maybe didn't go the way she wanted. And now she had to think next time, 
What information do I need to make a better choice the next time? Those are the types of critical thinking skills that we want to be teaching to our kids at this age to help them so that when they're at those parties when they're older or when they're in their romantic relationships and they're kissing and hugging and touching and feeling and it all feels really good, that in the moment they can think, what information do I need to know right now to make a next decision? Our kids don't get to just have those critical thinking skills. They have to practice them, which means that we need to give them opportunities to practice. Now, you've heard that like most of what I have said so far actually has nothing to do with sex, right? Thinking about knowing your body, understanding it, appreciating it, showing love in different ways, practicing effective decision-making. And that's because raising sexually healthy kids is not just about talking to them about sex. It is not just telling them what sex is and that they should or should not engage in sexual behaviors. Raising sexually healthy kids is a much bigger picture. And that's because for a lot of us, the way we view sex or our values around sex are also a bigger picture. A lot of us think of sex as emotional and physical and relational, right? We think about it in all of these ways. So if we just tell our kids what sex is and think that we've kind of covered it, then all we've done is tell them that sex is a thing that people do. But I'm guessing that a lot of us want our kids to know all of those other things, the emotions of it, right? The cognitive aspects of it, the, uh, the relational aspects of it. And that comes from us teaching them about all of these things and other aspects of their lives too. So when it comes to raising sexually healthy kids, I want you to think you're already doing a lot of this good work. When you're letting your kids make some of these decisions, when we're letting our kids see us make decisions and fail and have to rethink things and try again. When we talk about our own bodies and we show appreciation for our own bodies rather than constantly critiquing our bodies or constantly talking negatively about bodies. Those are ways that we are raising sexually healthy kids. You're doing a lot of the work now. When I talk to parents about raising sexually healthy kids, I, I emphasize it so much because I think it's so important that we remember, yes, we know that these are ongoing conversations, but I want you to know that there are more conversations than just about what sex is. I hope that you have a lot of conversations with your kids about what sex is and what your behavioral expectations might be and what your values around sex are. But when we're talking about raising first through third graders, there's actually not that much sexual discussion that we need to have. These are the years that you get to focus on raising sexually healthy kids in kind of all of these other ways, practicing and getting them ready for those critical thinking skills that they're going to need when they are in their adolescence and when they're away from you and they're in independent relationships. We can do a lot of that work now to set them up for success later. All right, I use this work by this woman named Dr. Ann Bernstein. She created these categories um, of developmental readiness for what our kids are ready to know and when they're ready to know it. And I always like to use these categories with parents because I think it's so helpful for us to have this kind of terminology so that we can understand what our kids are ready to know and how they process the world. So I'm gonna share with you those categories for where your kids are at. And then we're gonna use that as kind of our guideline for how we're gonna approach some of the more specific topics that are related to sex and sexuality and bodies and uh, reproduction and puberty. And I promise we will get to all of that. If you're still waiting, like, wait, I actually signed up for this because I do wanna know how to tell my kids what sex is. I promise we are gonna get there tonight. I just wanted you to know that's not all that there is to it. All right, so Bernstein calls our really young kids. So the parents of kids that I met with last week were parents of like preschool and kindergartners. And she calls those young kids geographers. And she calls them geographers because geographers like to know where things are and what they're called. And if you have a little geographer, if you have a little preschool or kindergartner, then yes, you are likely aware that this is what they spend their day doing. They love soaking up vocabulary. They love learning where things are, what they're called. They want to tell you about all the new things that they've learned, right? They like to show you all of the stuff. Their brains are just soaking in that geographer stuff, where it is and what it's called. So when I was talking with parents last week, or if you have little geographers at your own home, the best thing we can do in terms of raising sexually healthy geographers is to use proper names and labels. And so we talked last week about the importance of proper names and labels. And so I'm sharing that with you now because as we get into what your age group of kids are called, 
I want us to know that if we haven't done some of this earlier geographer work, that's actually a really good place for us to start. So if you have not been using proper names and labels when it comes to body parts in your own home, that's something that you can start to make some small changes on now and it will go a really long way. So kids at this age, geographers and this next age group, which we'll talk about here in a moment, they should know, both boys and girls should know that boys have a penis and testicles and that girls have, I always say girls have a thousand body parts. I pick two and I pick the two V words. Girls have a vagina and a vulva. We want our kids to know that there are complex bodies, that it is not just a vagina that as later on, they're gonna realize, holy smokes, it's really not just a vagina. There's a lot more there, right? And we want them to know that there's more going on, that there's something inside and there's something outside. So for girls, we do wanna uh, label multiple parts. So both boys and girls can know that boys have a penis and testicles and girls have a vagina and vulva. Both boys and girls can know that babies grow in a uterus because they do. That's the really special part of our body that is designed just for kind of caring for a baby. And that's really unique, right? And it's unique to a woman's body also. So it can help us answer some other questions as we get older uh, or as our kids get older and they might wanna ask some questions about who has babies and how does that work? Well, when we can tell them that there's a special place called a uterus where babies grow, that's really helpful language for them. We can also tell our young kids, our geographers, that it takes a man's body and a woman's body to make a baby. We can even go so far as to tell them that it takes sperm and egg to make a baby because it does every single time. So regardless of how your baby got to your family, regardless of whether you have two moms or two dads or you are adopting or you had uh, you know, medical assistance to get pregnant, none of that actually matters in how that baby was created. There was sperm and there was an egg. So there was a man's body and a woman's body. So when we talk about this early developmental readiness for our kids, we're talking about like preschoolers can know those kinds of things. So again, as we get into this next category where your kids are at, if we haven't caught them up yet with some of the geographer language, then we wanna start doing that now. And I'm happy to give you some tips and ideas for how to start incorporating that language in your home if you haven't already. So as we go on, if you have questions about that, you can let me know in the chat or at the end. Your kids, this group of kids who are about first through third graders, Bernstein calls them manufacturers, manufacturers, because Bernstein says these kids are beyond those names and labels, right? They want to know a lot more than that. These are the kids who are like, cool story about the sperm and egg mom, um, but how do the sperm and egg meet? Yeah, manufacturers want to know how it all works. Manufacturers want to know how it all works. So while your geographers were satisfied with the naming and the labeling of things, they were like, wow, that's so cool, right? Your manufacturers are like, I have questions. <laughs> and if your manufacturers aren't asking you questions, because a lot of them won't, especially around this topic, because at very early ages, kids are already developing sense, a sense of insecurity or shame around their bodies. And that is not to say that that comes from you, that also comes from the world we live in. It comes from everywhere around them, right? That we have kind of this built in, like we don't want people to feel that great about their bodies kind of um, society. So we know that kids are getting a lot of these mixed messages about their bodies and a lot of mixed messages about what they should know about their bodies. So that's why a lot of our kids actually won't come to us with some of these questions. They're not sure that they should even know anything to be asking a question about. They don't know that, especially if we've never used the word penis or vulva or vagina, they're gonna have a harder time coming to us and asking questions about their penis or their vulva or their vagina. So when we think about why it was so important to go back and do some of that geographer level work, it's because if we want our kids to be able to process information that's developmentally appropriate at this manufacturer stage, we have to know that they have the, the tools in place already from the geographer stage. If my son has a question about what is happening to his penis and I wanna be able to talk about an erection, it's a lot more comfortable to talk about an erection and a penis if we've used the word penis before, right? Whereas if he's never heard me say that word, he is far less likely to come to me and ask me a question about that body part. When my daughter does get her first period, She's far less likely to come and talk to me about it or ask me questions about it. If she's never heard me talk about my own body, my own period maybe, or if I have one or if I don't have one. 
And if she's never heard me talk about words like vagina, vulva, even things like tampon, pad, the word period or menstruation, if they don't know that vocabulary, it's way more difficult for them to come and ask us about that as they get older. So it's kind of just like fun scaffolding also, by the way, right? If we can start when they're young, giving them the names, then as they get older, they're going to want to know how it works and they're going to feel more comfortable asking us about it. And then as they get even older, we're going to be able to give them all of the details that they need as they hit those next developmental stages. Okay, so manufacturers. If geographers, if the name of the game was quite literally names and labels, then for manufacturers, it's how it all works. And what does that mean for sexual, uh, sexual preparedness and raising sexually healthy kids? Well, the thing I wanna focus on the most tonight is that manufacturers are ready to know how it all works. They are ready to know how babies are made. And they are ready to know kind of, by the way, a lot of the ways that babies are made. But when most kids have a question about like where babies come from, how babies are made, most kids are asking, quite literally like the origin story of a sperm and egg and how they meet. So again, even if your baby came to your family in a different way, you can certainly share that story and we can talk about ideas for how to bring that up. We talked about that a little bit last week with some great parents who had questions about that. But most kids, when they wanna know about how babies are made or where babies come from, they're ready to know the story of kind of the original reproduction of how a sperm and egg might meet. So I wanna talk through that example with you. I wanna talk through how we might share that with our kids. I know it might seem by the way, like you might have to check, like, is your computer really working? Like, did she really just say that my first grader is ready to know? Yes. Now I will tell you, I am not suggesting that your first grader needs to know about this tonight. You do not need to get off of this meeting, go wake up your kids and be like, we got a conversation to have. Not what I'm suggesting. But if your first grader is coming to you and asking about it, that means that developmentally they're ready to know and they can know. So let's give some examples here. So let's say, oh, and we'll go through this same thing that I did with parents last week. So if, you, if we have any repeat parents, you'll, this will be familiar. But let's say that your kid comes to you and they say, you know, they say, dad, where did I come from? And then, right, you're like, all right, Heidi told me I gotta do the sperm and egg thing. I'm gonna launch into the sperm and egg story. But let's just say that after you launched into that sperm and egg story, when your son or your daughter said to you, where did I come from? And then they're like, uh-huh. Okay, but like Charlie says he's from Texas. Where did I come from? Okay, right? So what we have there is a situation where we, our adult brains, interpreted a question in that sexual way because as adult sexual beings, I'm guessing you can all be considered a sexual adult because you're here about something for parents and caregivers, right? So then we're going to say our adult sexual brain interpreted it a very different way than what our child's brain meant to say. So before we actually launch into how to tell our kids the real story about the sperm and egg, let's first share this, that our brains perceive information the same way our kids' brains do. But because we have this experience that our kids don't have, we are often putting our experience into our child's perception. Here's an easier way of saying that, right? Adult sexuality is different than child sexuality. We're all sort of sexual beings. We just don't put that into practice until different times of our life. We typically don't think of young people as being sexual until they go through puberty and their bodies are more capable of being sexual. But here's the thing, when it comes to kind of our sexual brains, we perceive information the same way. Everything I see, I hear, I taste, I smell, right? Goes into my brain. My brain tries to make sense of what it is by comparing it to everything else that I've ever seen or heard or tasted or smelled before in the world. That's just called the perception process. And that process is the exact same for you as it is for your eight-year-old. The only difference is that you have 20, 30, 40 more years of experience on this planet for your brain to compare things against. Your eight-year-old had like the eight years. So that's why when your kid comes to you and says, where did I come from? Your brain is like, oh my gosh, I'm sweating. Okay, this is it. This is the big moment. We got to talk about sperm and egg. This is it. But your child was simply asking, you no, know, like, where did I come from? Like, am I from a different state? Am I from the city? Like, where did I come from? So many of the things that we think about when it comes to talking to our kids about sex, we are actually thinking about it in a very different way than our kids are because of this process of how our brains work. 
because you have had sexual experiences, because we live in a world where as adults, you are exposed to sexuality on a daily basis, right? Your experiences are shifting how you perceive things. This is why, by the way, if you think about the last time, maybe you were with a group of friends or just a group of adults, and somebody said something that was like a sexual innuendo, or somebody said something and it, it slipped out wrong, right? And it came out and everyone's laughing because it sounded sexual. You notice that the adults in the room were laughing. The kids were not. The kids don't get it. They don't get it because they don't have those experiences. Maybe you've been watching a movie lately with your kids and somebody says something and you think, oh my gosh, did they catch that? And you watch that it just went right over your kid's head, right? Because they didn't know that they were supposed to catch that, right? They didn't know that there was something to catch because it was very adult-based. I bring that up real quickly here because I do think that so much of, as parents, what we think about and what we worry about when it comes to talking to our kids about sex, I think a lot of it we overreact about, right? I think a lot of times we need to just like take a breath, calm down and really get at what is my child actually wanting to know here? If your child comes home after school and repeats something they heard on the school bus, and your first reaction is to get all worked up and say, oh my gosh, who said that? And I have to call their parents and I can't believe they heard that. And you're freaking out about it. Maybe it's not what you think because maybe first we need to figure out what did our child really hear? What was really said? And am I interpreting it the same way or am I overreacting and actually making this something that's sexual when it's not? A prime example, I was with some people uh, over the weekend and uh, there was a little girl and she was kind of just running around dancing and making up these little dance moves, right? And she made up these dance moves that they looked kind of like she was like, you know, doing something that maybe as an adult, you might think that seems like a very adult dance move, right? But she was like three and there's no way that she knew that anybody was going to interpret it in any other way other than she was just moving her body the way she wanted to move it in that moment. And I think that there's often times where our kids do things like that. And you might say like, stop, that's not appropriate. Well, your little one didn't know that that wasn't appropriate. And there was actually nothing inappropriate about what they were doing. Your interpretation of what they were doing might've been inappropriate, right? But that's our adult sexuality and we're putting it onto that child, right? So sometimes it's best just for us to take that breath, figure out what's really going on and then go from there. So that's something to keep in the back of our minds, especially as we head into these conversations. Okay, but let's circle back now. And let's go back to that story where your kid comes to you and they say, dad, where did I come from? Okay, so let's say this time, instead of launching into the sperm and egg story, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna say, I love that you're asking me that. Even if like secretly you're terrified and sweating and you are not happy that they're asking you that, you're gonna tell them, I love that you're asking me that. And you're doing that because you want your child to know that any question they have about this stuff, they are doing the right thing by coming and talking to you. That is the right thing to do. That their curiosity about this stuff is never going to be a problem. And that's helpful as they get older, by the way, that their curiosity is never going to be the problem. Where they go to get their curiosity kind of satisfied, we might not always like that. We might not always like what access they have and what exposures they have, but their curiosity is not the problem. And we wanna start teaching them that message when they're young. So now when they come to us and they ask us these questions, it might not be the best time, right? You might think, why do they always do this like at bedtime? Or why are they always doing this? Like I'm about to drop them off for school. We don't have time to talk about this. Okay, you might not be able to get into a long conversation about it, but you can still say, I love that you asked me that. Thank you so much for asking me that. Our kids love validation and we know it. So we want to keep validating them. You did the right thing by asking me. Then we're going to flip it on our kids and we're going to say, what do you think? What do you think? And we're asking our kids what they think for a couple of reasons. First, let's try to avoid the whole like Charlie's from Texas thing, right? Let's try. So if I say, well, what do you think? And if your child says, well, Charlie says he's from Texas, where did I come from? Ah, uh, okay. No. Nope right? Then you can say you're from Chicago, right? You're from Arlington Heights. You're from Minneapolis, wherever it might be, right? And then you can move on and you don't have to get into anything else. But let's say that your child says, um, well, like, I know I like came from mom's body. Okay. 
now I know that my child is really asking some questions about how babies are made. So then what I can do is I can say to my uh, child, I can say, again, I am just so glad that you asked me that, right? So I'm saying, thank you so much for asking me this. I'm going to switch out my light here, by the way. It just went down on us. Uh, we're going to say, thank you so much for asking me. What do you think? They give us our answer. We say, oh, I just love that your brain works like that. Thank you so much for asking me. We're praising them yet again. There is literally not enough times that we can praise our kids for uh, asking us these questions and coming to us with these questions. Then we're going to say, would you like me to tell you how babies are made? So we've already said a lot of things to them. We've thanked them for coming to us. We've clarified what they're asking. We thank them again. We said, I love that your brain is working like this. And now we're asking permission essentially to continue on with the conversation. We're asking to clarify, do you wanna know this? I'm confirming that that is what they wanna know. They wanna know how babies are made. I'm also confirming that they have the attention span to sit there because some of your kids by now are like, oh my goodness, I don't even know. I had a question 12 seconds ago and I forgot it and I'm over it and can I move on, right? And if that is where they're at, that is okay. There is no reason why we need to be forcing the conversation on our kids at this age, right? Now, there is a time when I talk to parents next week, parents of fourth through sixth graders, I'll say, yeah, okay. There is a time where we need to be kind of forcing the conversation, but it's not now in first or second grade. Typically I say it's like between third and fourth grade, if we have not had these conversations, then that's a time that we would wanna actually initiate it and kind of get through the conversation. But if your first grader is like, I don't know, I'm done, I don't have any questions anymore, then you can let them go. And you can say, okay, great. Well, anytime you wanna talk about it, I'm here. We don't want our kids to ever feel trapped in these conversations. We don't want them to ever feel like we're forcing them to sit and listen to something that they don't really wanna to listen to. I'm guessing that some of you have had experiences like that with your own parents, and you remember that that did not feel good. So we are trying to do something different. All right, but let's revisit and let's say that after I go through all of that and I say, would you like me to tell you how babies are made? If your kid is like, yeah, that's what I wanna know. Okay, so now we've clarified what they want and now we're going to use our time and tell them this process of how babies are made. And here's what we can say. We're gonna, again, cause we can't say it enough. We're gonna say, I just love that your brain works like this. Then we're going to say, in our family, we believe. And we get to use that phrase. And this is where every family in this Zoom room gets to say something a little bit different, right? Every family has a little bit of a different belief about kind of when babies should be made in what relationship context they think babies should be made. And every family also has a different experience about how their babies were made right? So if you think about, let's say you're a family and you would like your kids to wait to uh, be sexually active until they're married. Uh, but let's say you did not wait to be married for when you were sexually active and you had children before you were married. And yet you're going to tell your kids that this only happens in marriage. Okay, well, they're pretty smart. And they're going to, at some point, figure out that this is a big lie, right? That at some point they're going to think, wait, my parents said that this happens in marriage, but I just figured out that they weren't married, right? Or they see that the girl next door uh, is pretty young. She looks pregnant. But my parents said that this only happens to adults. Okay, well, now I have questions. We don't want to give our kids any opportunity to, to lack in trust for us. We don't want to give them any opportunity to doubt us and think that we were not telling them information. Our job is to give our kids the real and accurate information in a way that we can also share our family values in a way that helps our kids feel like, wow, I've learned something from my parents here. And I now trust that if I have more questions about this, I can go back and ask them. That's what we're trying to build here with our kids. Not just like, oh, I have to tell them everything I've ever thought about this and I need to do it right now, but rather I'm gonna use this moment with them to answer their question truthfully. I'm gonna share a little bit about my values but I wanna make sure that first and foremost, I'm building trust that I'm the right one that they came to with this question so that we don't tempt them to go and ask their friends or their teachers even, or try to Google this stuff. All right, so we say, in our family, we believe. And then you're just gonna insert like just a couple words. This is not a 30 minute lecture on like all of your religious beliefs. This is just like a couple, a couple words. So you might say, in our family, we believe 
that when two adults really love each other. Okay. You might say in our family, we believe that when two adults are married. In our family, we believe that when people really love, love and care for each other, right? Something, that's it. That is the extent of what I'm suggesting that you fill in the blanks with. Now, again, maybe next week and the week after when I talk to parents, we're going to get into like, okay, but what else do we say? And how do I explain all of this stuff? That's for later, not for now. For now, I'm just trying to give my kids a little hint that our family has a belief, a value about what I'm about to say. I'm not going to lecture you about what that value is. I'm just letting you know our family has a belief about this, right? So we say in our family, we believe that when two people are married, um, they like to kiss and touch and they hug each other in ways that feels really good. So I'm telling them that when these people are in that relationship, they're, they like to kiss and touch and hug each other in ways that feels really good. I'm letting them know that there's lots of ways to show love and affection, right? We talked about that earlier. And I'm letting them know that this should feel pretty good. I'm not going to launch into the whole pleasure thing right now, or the, but I'm going to say, hint, hint, that should be a piece of it, right? So I say in our family, we believe that when two adults really love each other, they like to kiss and touch and hug each other in ways that feels really good. One way they can do that, one way, not the only way, not the best way, right? One way they do that, meaning that they show love, is they can put the man's penis inside of the woman's vagina and sperm can come out of his body and go inside of her body. And if the sperm meets up with an egg, sometimes a baby is made. And that's it. And I'm gonna repeat it all and I'm gonna put it all together in a nice little package for you here. But I want you to think about it. What we've done is we've let our kids come to us with a question. We've said, oh gosh, you're so smart. Thank you so much for asking us. So we've patted them on the back, right? Then we've said, what do you think? We're trying to make sure that we're answering the right question. Then we once again said, oh, I just love that you came to me. Thank you so much. Pat on the back again. Then we said, would you like me to tell you how babies are made? Right? So I'm clarifying, is this the question that you're asking? And then they say like, yes, mom, you're the best. That's like what I imagine that they're going to say when I do this, right? Yes, mom, you're the best. All right. Then I say, okay, in our family, we have a belief about this. So in our family, we believe this is just the brief abbreviated version of what we believe that this is something when people love each other. And then I say, there's lots of ways that they're going to show love to each other right? Lots of ways. And it feels good. Here's one way, not the only way, not the best way, right? And then you notice that I said that they, they can put the man's penis inside of the woman's vagina because this is a consensual act. I'm not going to launch into a lecture about consent in this conversation. That's not what they were asking, but I'm going to hint that consent is part of it, right? So I say that they do this. And then I explained that the sperm can come out of his body. It can go inside of her body and it can meet up with an egg. And then I said, if the sperm and egg meet, sometimes a baby is made because this does not happen every time. And then that gives us permission, right? To launch into more information later about how it doesn't always lead to a baby. And that for some people, right? There are different ways that they need to get the sperm and egg to meet. But when kids again are asking about how babies are made they are typically asking for that process. They know that there is a way that people are referencing when they talk about babies and reproduction and they wanna know what it is. Let me say it all together quickly, right? Because this is how long it would take you with your kids. It does not need to take longer. They say, dad, where did I come from? Oh, what a good question. Wow. What do you think? Um, like, I, I know I came from mom's body, but like, I don't get it. Oh yeah. I just love that you're thinking about this stuff. Thanks so much for asking me. Would you like me to tell you how babies are made? Yes, dad, you're the best. Well, in our family, we believe that when adults really love each other, they can kiss and touch and hug each other in ways and just feels really good. And one way they can do that is they can put the man's penis inside of the woman's vagina and the sperm can come out of his body and go inside of her body and meet up with an egg. And if the sperm and egg meet, sometimes a baby is made. Now, I didn't time it this time, but I have timed it at another speaking event and it was about 33 seconds. That's how long it took to say that. Here's the key. We often, again, think like, oh, this is a big topic. My kid is coming to me with this really important topic and I got to say it all. And I got to say it all right now, because what if I never get to talk to them again about it? And I have so many things and I want them to know what our family thinks, but I need them to know about our family situation. I need them to know what I think about the whole world. And I want them to know about my values and I have to tell them what they're going to hear from other people. And oh, okay, but sometimes this happens and sometimes this doesn't. And we get so worked up about it. 
because for a lot of us, sex is complicated. It's heavy. It's emotional. And we have had a lot of experiences, at least thinking or engaging in these behaviors. And for our kids, we need to remember they just had a question about how babies were made. And that was it. Developmentally, they're ready to know that. And then what we've done is we've set the stage now to be able to come back and say, hey, remember that time that we were talking about how babies were made? Remember how we were saying that it's something that they choose to do together? Yeah, I wanted to talk to you more about that because that's a word called consent. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about consent. Great, so then I can have the consent conversation later. Or I can say, hey, remember that time we were talking about how babies were made? And I was saying that like, it's just like one way that like that process of sexual intercourse and how reproduction can happen that we were saying that's like one way that they can show love. That's because there's so many other ways that people can show intimacy in their relationships. So I wanted to talk about that. Or we can say, remember that time that we were telling you about how babies were made and we talked about the sperm and the egg. And remember how I said that sometimes the baby is made? Well, I wanted to talk to you about that because that doesn't always result in having a baby. In fact, people engage in sexual intercourse a lot of times and there is no baby. And I wanted to tell you about that. Or I wanted to talk to you about how sometimes the sperm and egg don't even meet. And maybe in our family, that's part of your story that I want you to hear about, right? I want you to hear about how babies can be made in different ways, but it does always still take that sperm and egg. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about how you came to our family. Right. But having that first kind of reproduction conversation done really gives us permission then to expand on it in other ways. All right. So let's say that I did that whole thing with my kids, that 33 second conversation, right? When I'm done and I say, sometimes a baby is made, I'm going to sit in silence and I'm going to give them like a good 10 seconds of just silence. As parents, most of us we crave silence, but then we're really bad at giving the silence to our kids, right? Because we think, oh, I just have so much I want to say. But this is our chance to really let our kids sit with their feelings. How do they feel about what we just said? Do they have questions about what we just said? And I don't want to prompt anything or get in the way of that thinking. So I'm just going to sit in silence. And if 10 seconds goes by and my kid has said nothing, then I'm going to say, that was such a good question. Do you have any more questions about that? And I'm, they, if they're like, nope, then you can say, okay, great. Well, I'm so glad you asked me that. Anytime you want to talk about this stuff, let me know. And I can send them on their way. Let's say that I get a whole, I get through the whole story and my kid says, that's like the grossest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> you can say, yeah, I know. It's okay that it seems gross. You want to know why? This isn't something for kids. Someday when you're an adult and you're thinking about how you're going to show love and you're thinking about if you want to have a baby, then this is something that you'll talk about. But until then, yeah, it's okay if you think it's gross. It's not for kids. And that's it. Now, some of your kids might have follow-up questions, right? And then we can talk about, well, how do we respond to those follow-ups? Most kids at this manufacturer age group, though, simply want to know how it works. And a lot of kids in this age group have already heard from somewhere that there's a story, right? And they've heard that people have different stories. They've seen the boss baby show. They've seen Storks the movie. They seem to think that like everybody's suggesting that this happens in a different way. Parents and grownups don't seem to be telling us the truth. So I need to know what's going on. Most of them have figured out that there's something to know and they just wanna know it, right? We don't need to overwhelm them with too much information, but we also need to trust that developmentally, they are ready to know how it works. Especially as we get to the older side of this age group, right? Those third graders, again, if you've got a third grader right now, it's okay if we've never had these conversations, it's okay if they're not asking us. But when we think about what happens in fourth grade, fourth grade is kind of a big turning point for a lot of kids. A lot of the kids in that class, girls in particular, will start to go through puberty. And we want our kids to be able to understand what puberty is and what kind of the like long-term process of puberty is. Like it can result in this body that can now have children, right? Or is at least like kind of has the ability or the capacity to maybe have children, right? We want them to understand that that's maybe what's happening. 
But it's a lot easier to explain that if they have first understood the developmental kind of readiness that we just talked about in explaining how a baby is made. And so we want our kids to know about things like puberty before it happens. And that means that we need to be talking to our kids about puberty in about that third grade year. Now, if they're asking questions earlier, if it comes up in conversation earlier, great. Your first grader wants to know something, let, let, them, let them know, right? Your first grader wants to know what that thing is in the bathroom and you wanna explain that it's a tampon, great, right? You can do that. But you don't have to worry about that and I say until about that third grade year, because what we want them to hear is hear that information from us, their parents. We want to be the primary sex educators in our kids' lives, not the internet, not their friends. And so what this means is that we want our kids to trust that if and when they have questions, they can come to us and they will get the truth, not a watered down version. If you have a manufacturer and you give them a geographer level answer, they're going to think, okay, great. She's never going to give me this actual information. We want to trust that when our kids are asking questions, they are ready to know. I have so many things that I could say at this manufacturer age group. We can talk about so many things, but I do want to make sure that I'm reserving plenty of time to talk about the things that matter to you and that I can help clarify some of the things that I've said tonight. So I see that Ellie put in a kind of a, a call for questions. We've already got a question in there that I'm gonna answer. But if you have questions, please go ahead and type them in that chat box. You can send them out to everybody and I'll read it there. Or if you send it just to me, um, that'll also pop up on my end. I wanna know what you're going through in your families, what questions you have that might be things that have come up or things that you know are going to come up. And let's make sure that you get the most out of our remaining 30 minutes tonight, all right? So great question uh, starting off right away here. So the question that I have first is when you have children across different age groups, how do you address these issues or how do you encourage your older children that they're not the spokespeople on this to everybody else, right? This is one of the most common questions that I get. Number one, not just across siblings, but it'll be like, how do I tell my kids that they shouldn't be the spokesperson on this to everybody else that they've ever met? Like they don't need to go to school and tell everybody else this, okay. Well, let me say a couple of things. So first, I always say there are like worse things that your child could do than be the spokesperson on this topic. And maybe not the spokesperson, but to know information and to share information, I know is not what we want as parents. We don't want our, our kids to be the one that have now told everybody else what sex is. I get that. Believe me, I understand. This is my job. You can imagine how when I tell people this, they're like, yeah, maybe my child doesn't need to talk with your child about all of this, right? I get this. But there are worse things your child can do. And I know that, and you know that, because we've all had our kids come home from school and tell us about some bizarre thing that some other kid told them that we are like, that is just not true, right? Some other kid just told you something that is not true. So if our kids at least know the truth, the factual information, and they happen to be repeating that, again, there are like worse things that I think they can do. But I still understand that we want to be mindful of the developmental readiness of the people around them. So if we're talking about in our own family with siblings, right? Like, let's say you've got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to tell my eight-year-old about some of this, but I don't want them telling my six-year-old or my three-year-old. Yeah. Okay. This is where we get to tap into just how smart our kids are. And we're going to say to our kids, hey, I'm loving that you asked me that question. Just your brain is so smart and I love how it works. I will always tell you the truth. In our family, we will always tell you the truth when you ask us these questions. But you know what? Your younger sister, she's just not quite ready to hear this information yet. So if you want to keep talking about it, you can come and talk to us anytime about it. But don't go and tell your sister about it. We want to wait till she's old enough to hear about it from us. That's something easy that we can say to our kids now. Um, let's say that they ask these questions like in the car together, right? So let's say that um, you're going somewhere and you've got all of those kids in the car with you and the older one is like, our baby's made. And you're like, oh my goodness, this is not the time. You're still going to take that same approach and you're gonna say, I love that you asked me that. What a good question. Then you can give them like a geographer level answer because you've got younger kids in the car. So you can say, it's actually pretty cool. And it takes a sperm and an egg and a sperm is from a man's body and an egg is from a woman's body. 
And if the sperm and egg meet, a baby is made, but it's actually pretty cool. So I'll tell you more about it later. And then the trick is you actually do need to follow up and tell them more about it later. So then you go back to that eight-year-old and you say, oh, that was such a smart question you asked in the car. I wanted to answer it in a way that your younger siblings could kind of understand, but there's a lot more to it. And I wanted to know if you still wanted to chat about it, right? And then we can have that conversation with the older kids. You're absolutely right in asking the question that we want to make sure that we don't make it taboo. So this is not where we're going to be like, listen, I'm going to tell you something, but do not tell anybody else. Like that's where we're going to get kids who are like, whoa, this feels secretive or this feels really interesting. And suddenly now I feel like I have a really heavy weight on my shoulders that you've shared this information with me. Part of not making it feel so taboo is just about how we answer the question in the first place, right? Helping them understand that it was a smart question. It was a good question. Happy that they came to us. There is nothing taboo about the question. When our response to them is factual, includes proper names and labels, includes all the information, when we can sit with it and not run away from it, all of that helps them feel like it's not taboo. So then when we add to that, that, hey, by the way, I shared this with you because I think you're old enough to know some of that, but I want to wait till your younger sibling is older to know more about it. Then that makes that once again, just seem like a factual thing. Like, I just wanted to wait till they're older, not a taboo thing. Like they really shouldn't know this yet. Right. When it comes to other kids at school, um, one of the things that I do, like for my daughter, for example, I, so I will tell you a little bit, my kids, my son is like textbook follows all of these guidelines, like to a T, just everything you could ever say about developmental readiness. I was like, yes, that is him. My daughter seems to be a little bit different. She's kind of all over the place and I'm not always sure what I'm going to get with her. My son very clearly understood that these are conversations we're having in our family. We can talk about them anytime. And I know that my daughter is the one who's going to be like, I'm going to go tell everybody about this because this is interesting. She wants to just in front of her friends, she wants to be kind of the one who knows information at school. She likes to be the one to raise her hand and answer all the questions. I know her personality enough to know that she's going to want to tell people. So with her in particular, when she was younger and we were talking about some of this, rather than making it sound so appealing, like she shouldn't, or she should or shouldn't tell everybody, we just made it very clear that there were specific people she shouldn't be telling. And I say that for this reason, because I know that even if I say to my daughter, hey, you know, this isn't something that you need to be going and telling everybody else. We should really let other people's moms and dads tell them about this. I know in her head, she's going to be like, um, yeah, but I'm going to go tell my best friend. Cause surely you don't mean that my best friend is included in like, don't tell everybody. Cause she's going to think that her friend is an exception to the rule. Right? So I'm going to say to her, Hey, I'm so glad that you asked me this. Anytime you want to talk about it, we can, but you know, just, we don't need to go tell everybody at school about it. We're going to let their moms and dads do it. So you don't need to go and tell Anna about this information. And I'm going to use the specific name so that my child very clearly is like, oh, oh, that, okay. So I shouldn't tell that person about it, right? That we're really trying to make sure that they understand that there's a specific, right? This isn't just generally speaking, we shouldn't be telling people. This is like, no, I actually don't want you going and talking to people that you might normally talk to about it. And I'm not trying to make it seem like a really big deal. I'm just saying, we're going to let their moms and dads let them know. It's the same thing. And I see that there's other questions in here and keep them coming by the way. Um, so I'll get to those other questions, but I want to share this example with you. And I realized that I've been yelling penis and vagina and sexual intercourse really loud. So if you have kids in the room, they've heard all of that, but I'm going to talk about, okay. So maybe now if you have kids in the room and you don't want them to hear about Santa, then like really mute yourself and really mute the computer and come back and watch the recording later. Yes, I have yelled penis 10 times, but I'm really going to protect this story for you. So if you are a family, for example, who around the holidays uh, kind of engages in this whole kind of story about you know who, right? Let's think about a couple ways that that can kind of be paralleled to this. Well, one is that at some point your kids have questions about that story. And at some point you likely maybe need to, to tell your child, hey, uh, don't go tell everybody about that, <laughs> right? So for in our family, I know that my son in particular came flat out with a very direct question about this when he was very young. Is this real? Tell me the truth was sort of his question. 
And our philosophy was to tell the truth, but to also make it clear, right, that we didn't need to go and tell that to everybody else. That part of the fun of it was that he was smart enough and he was mature enough that he was knowing this. So now he can have this information, but he doesn't need to share it. My, I say that because I'm guessing that some of you have been in that situation before where you've had to tell your kids something, right? But you don't want them to tell other people. And so this really isn't that different, right? Sometimes I think because it's about sex, we feel like, oh, it's so different. Like I really got to protect this information, but like, not really, right? Not necessarily. It doesn't have to be that different than some of these other topics. It's still a story or information that we are sharing in our family. We want to be able to talk about in our family. And we're trying to say, let's let other people's families discuss that, right? We don't want them to spoil the information for other people, but we also don't need them to um, feel like it's something so terrible if they did. It will not be the end of the world if your child happens to give the very factual story of how a baby is made, right? It will be awkward and embarrassing maybe, but it's better than if your child gives some made up story for how babies are made. And then all of the kids are very confused and have even more questions about it. I also think about developmentally that when we think about that whole Santa thing, right? That we think about your geographers are the ones who like buy into that story all the way, right? They're like, yep, there's this guy and he goes around the world and it's easy peasy. There's like a reindeer with a blow. And your geographers, the names and labels kids, right? They are like, makes sense to me. Your manufacturers are often the kids who are like, I have questions. Does this guy really go around the whole world in one night? Tell me the truth, right? And even if they're not coming to you with that question yet, they're starting to usually think about some of that stuff and question it themselves during this manufacturer time frame. And it's just because again, developmentally, the way that they look at the world is like, how does this work? It's more than just tell me what it is and where it is. It's how does this really work? Um, okay, so I think that we've talked a little bit about that. I'm happy to expand more. Um, there was a question about books and Ellie and I were talking about some books earlier. Um, I have a couple recommendations, but I'm gonna start and I'm gonna let Ellie, if you wanna share some of the books that you have, um, I'll let you share some of those and then I'll share some examples. Sure, so I did, I brought some, um, from Arlington Heights Library today. So these are in our collection if you're interested in checking them out. Um, and there are two really great books. This first one is called Yes, No. And it's a first conversation about consent. Sorry, my, I'm a little weirdly lit here, but you can see that I will send the titles in the chat as well. Um, but I think it's a really great book um, because not only does it talk about consent with young children, talking about like Heidi was mentioning earlier, consenting about giving hugs or about being touched while you're getting dressed with your parent in the morning. Um, it also features a really wide variety of body shades and skin tones and um, different looks of people, which is really great for kids. Um, there is one page in here that shows some like anatomically correct illustrations as well. So that can be really helpful for if you have a child who is a boy and they're wondering about what parts a girl has or something. There's elements in there as well. Um, Heidi, I don't know if you had anything to add about that one in particular. Yeah, so it came up last week. A parent had asked about books again. And I always, I was joking that I know this is not the right format because I'm here on behalf of the library, but I really just don't love most of the books that are out there. Um, and that's because I'm pretty particular about the word choices that are used in the books, but also the images. And so I had shared last week that um, some of the images in the books are, you know, they're usually very cartoonish for young kids. And while we think that that's in some ways better, sometimes the cartoon nature of it just is not very realistic. And again, by this manufacturer age group, a lot of kids are like, okay, but like, I wanted to know like what it looks like. And that's just like another cartoon. And I wanted to know like, what does that actually look like? So sometimes I think that's challenging as our kids get older. And so we want to give them like, you know, more kind of actual or factual, um, like anatomically correct images without Googling, what does a penis look like, right? So sometimes I think like if you Google on your own and you just want to come up with like, you know, the anatomically correct um, body parts and you want to come up with one that labels everything, you can print off that page. Um, there's a couple books that I recommend um, for parents, not for kids. There's one that's just called How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex. And it's by a woman named Dr. Laura Berman. And in there, it's um, it's a DK publishing book, which is just a really great kind of book. And it's got great conversation starters and pictures, but they're just like 
drawings or kind of like outlines of bodies, but they're not cartoons. And I think that that is helpful for our kids to see that. Um, I also was commenting last week and Ellie and I were talking about this and that's why I think she mentioned it too, but that some of my frustration is that books are usually very like Eurocentric. So they're usually very just like, these are what, you know, white bodies look like. And that can, we know from research that that can create a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of confusion and a lot of insecurity about people's bodies, because even among white people, not all white penises look the same, not all white vulvas or vaginas look the same, but especially when we think about different body shapes and sizes and different ethnicities and skin colors, we really think we want to be understanding that there's a diverse um, kind of representation of what all bodies look like. And that doesn't mean that we expose our kids to more images. That's not what we need to do. It just means that maybe from the beginning, we can be more mindful about the images that we are putting in front of them. That's why a book like um, the Yes, No book is so great because just on a very basic level, we're showing them a picture book that has a lot of different things represented, which is just, again, really setting the stage for kind of better conversations later on. Did you have another one, Ellie? I did. This one um, doesn't feature as much like sexual health information. Um, it's called Bodies Are Cool. Um, it was one of our featured books last summer because I just love this book. Um, and it really hits what Heidi was talking about, just normalizing a lot of different bodies. I mean, I don't even think you can count how many people are in this book. And it just talks about round bodies, muscled bodies, bodies are cool. And every single page has a whole different variety of skin tones, shades, sizes, heights, um, ability differences. And so it can be a really great way to kind of um, set up that foundation of just like neutrality and appreciation of what our bodies do for us, rather than having a feeling of shame or um, kind of feeling like it's a taboo subject or just it kind of is a very neutral celebratory book, which is nice. Yes. Thank you so much. And then I'm going to put in the chat, there's two other books that I like um, that aren't necessarily talking to our kids about sex. It's more about preparing them for puberty, um, but it's a little bit just about how to, and I think, but they're totally age appropriate for this manufacturer age group. I think in fact that they say like, um, I think they're listed usually for like ages around like eight and up, but I gave them to both of my kids when they were more like the seven-year-old age group. Um, so I'm going to send you, let's see if this works. Oh, that's just a really long Amazon link. But if you click on that, let's see it. Ellie, do you want to try it and just see if it worked? Um, let's see if I can copy the link. Yes, here. looks good. Okay, so that's a link for a book um, about boys. It's called Growing Up Late. Let's see if we, oh, look at this. This is a much smaller link when I did it the right way. Uh, this next one is a book called Celebrate Your Body and it's the ultimate puberty book for girls. And both of these books are books that I have given to my own children. Um, and in fact, I will tell you all of my daughter's friends have this because you can imagine that the parents come to me and they're like, what, what book should I do? And I said, well, this is what my child's reading. And so now all of her and her friends, they are reading the same book, but that means that they have access to the same information. And I kind of actually love that. I kind of like that they all are at the same place and what they're learning. What I really like about this book is that it's written for kids. So it's kind of on that level you obviously should read all of these books first. So that is my recommendation for parents when it comes to books about bodies or sex um, or sexuality, that you wanna be reading them first and make sure that you know what language is being used. If it's a book that's not using the right anatomically correct terms, that's one that I would say kind of like not needed. Um, if it's a book that uses like really ridiculous pictures, um, that's one that you just wanna maybe like highlight with your kids like, hey, this looks kind of funny. That's not how bodies look, but you can still use the book. Like there's this one book and I actually love the book itself, but um, the body hair that's depicted in the book looks like prickly. It's like, looks like pokey, like toothpicks almost. And I keep thinking that's scary. Like that would look scary if I was a kid and I thought that's what's going to happen to my body. So it's just something where you can acknowledge that and say, whoa, that's not really what body hair looks like. And then you can do things like hey, look at my arm, like this is body hair and they're showing you that it looks like this. And so you can just kind of show more examples and talk through it. And, and then obviously like there are some books that will talk more about um, intercourse and they won't put like a, a, a kind of relationship context about it. There are books that will talk about um, 
um, sexuality and gender identity, which I think are really important for our kids to know and understand, but you might want to have some kind of guidelines around how your own family and your family values are included in that. So just giving our kids books, you know, kind of like hoping that we're, we're done with that. I always think it should be a little bit more than that. It should really be family communication first, and then books are kind of supplemental. Um, but yeah, so those are some of our favorites. Um, all right. Are there other questions? I think LA, you have some questions that you can um, ask on behalf of people. Yeah. Um, actually, one of them really relates to what you were just talking about. I know you kind of talked about your kids preparing them for maybe not bringing it up to their friends, but I have a question about how do we address what our kids hear from others, from friends or older co cousins or family members? Yeah. Um, professionally, I can talk a lot about this, but I will also tell you personally that I hear a lot from my own kids. And, you know, as a parent, sometimes I just, I just want to be like, what, what are they telling you? Who said that? I'll never forget. Um, there was a day that my son came home. I think he was like in fourth grade and he said, he was like, mom, this kid said this thing at recess. You have to tell me if it's true. And I won't repeat it here because it's, I thought it was shocking, but I remember thinking like, no, that is not true at all. And I was trying not to overreact. You know, I didn't want to make him feel uncomfortable, but I also thought like, that is not true. And if this is the information that kids are sharing, like we got a long ways to go. Now I will tell you that some other stories, um, there was a time that, um, again, I won't repeat it exactly, but my son was in um, a like group chat. So during COVID, I remember his fifth grade teacher had encouraged all the kids if they had any kind of like device, he had encouraged them to share their phone numbers or their emails with people um, so that they could keep in touch because they weren't seeing each other, right? And so he was trying to build some community in the class, which was a really great idea, except that now all of a sudden all of these kids had phone numbers and emails for each other. And so there was a lot of chatting and texting that needed to be maybe moderated by parents and it wasn't always. Um, but we saw, well, my son came to us and said, hey, I think you need to see this text message that I got. And we read the text message. And again, I thought, okay, that's a lot, right? But here's what I'll share. It was about oral sex. And here's what I'll tell you is that my son already knew about some of that stuff. He already knew what sexual intercourse was. We had talked about that there are other sexual behaviors, not in a lot of depth, but in enough that he at least knew what that was. Um, and I remember saying to him, like I was able to keep it a little bit cool because what was actually said as a parent, I probably would not have kept my cool, but I was able to keep my cool a little bit and be like, thank you so much for sharing that with me. Aren't you really glad you already know about that? And that was my response to him was to say, because I knew that there were some other kids in that text exchange that I knew because I know some of their parents and I thought they don't know anything of what that person is referencing. And the questions that they must have, the confusion they must have, the way that those other kids must feel, and the kind of dilemma of whether those kids are going to go ask their parents about it. And I kind of already knew how that was going to shape out. Like a lot of those kids were not going to go and talk to their parents about it. But here, my son already knew about it. So he was able to tell me, and I was able to just say, aren't you glad you already know about that? Do you have more questions about it? And he didn't. And then what we're able to do is remove it from that situation. So that's all I ever said. I will never forget. I was making a spaghetti dinner and I was facing the noodles when he said that to me. And then my mouth really did drop open when he shared what was said. But I remember that's all I said. We left it alone. And I waited a couple of days. I was able to wait a couple of days before I said, Hey, I was thinking more about that text message. That was kind of weird that that person sent that to you. Did anything else ever happen with that? No, nobody, like we all kind of left the chat or like we left the group and no one ever said anything about it. Okay. Well, did you have more questions about what he meant or like why he said what he said? And then we were able to have a conversation, but it was separate from the emotion, the weight of the moment. And I think about that is not to say that like pat on my back, I've done everything right because there have been plenty of examples, by the way, that this mom uh, has not done everything right. And I have had been in plenty of awkward situations, but I think about how different it would have been if I would have had to hear my son read that text to me, or if I would have seen it on my own, because maybe he wouldn't share it with me. And if I had to go to him and say, um, I feel like we need to have a really long conversation. And suddenly this text that he was maybe already embarrassed about and unsure about became now the catalyst to like a really heavy, big conversation about sexual intercourse, sexual behaviors, who we talk about this stuff with, what kind of words we use, why do we don't talk about this with our friends or why we don't put this via text, right? Like 
I would have wanted to purge all of that information to him in one conversation. And that would have felt very heavy. And we're trying to avoid the heaviness of these conversations so that our kids can trust that we can have multiple conversations and it's never going to be a lecture. That's why we're always trying to make sure we're thinking, what is the real question that they're asking? And I wanna make sure I just answer that question. That's it. I am not gonna go above and beyond unless they're asking me to go above and beyond because I want them to know that I will answer their question and I can be done with it so that they know if I have a question, my mom will answer it right away. And then we don't have to sit and have a big talk about it. And you know, my kids will say to me about other things in life. They'll be like, oh, I don't need a lecture about it. And I'll be like, well, maybe you do need a lecture about it, right? <laughs> Cause that's what we think. But I, in my head, at least around this topic, no lecture, right? So in terms of what they, what else we can say to our kids when they get this stuff. So you can obviously tell that where I'm going with this is to say the more information they have up front, the better. That's gonna make all of the things that they hear from their friends or their cousins better. If you can say, we've already talked about this, right? The best thing that we can do when our kids come and tell us something or we see something that they've heard or talked about with other kids, I think the best thing that we can do is to ask our kids how they feel about that. So we can say, wow, okay, your cousin told you that? How do you feel about that? That also gives us a chance as a parent to take that breath, right? Like, don't get angry at my sibling for the fact that his child just said this. Don't get angry at our neighbor because they just showed my kid this. This gives me a chance to say what matters most right now is the relationship I have with my child. And I don't want to get them feeling angry or in trouble. I don't want them to think that they're, um, you know, they're at risk for being in trouble about this. I want them to know that they did the right thing by sharing with me or that they're doing the right thing by listening to me. And I first and foremost, just want to know, how do you feel about that? Some of your kids are going to engage in that conversation willingly. And they'll be like, I thought it was so weird that they said that, or I didn't understand any of it, or I'm worried because I don't think I'm supposed to say that. Some of your kids will be really engaged. Some of your kids are going to be like, I feel fine. I don't want to talk about it. And they might not say that they're just going to imply that. And then you can say, yeah, we don't need to talk about it now, but it makes me think that maybe soon we should be talking about X, Y, or Z, right? If there's just direct misinformation that's being given, like the example where my son came home and said, is this what that means? Then you can just say like, nope, that's not what that means. Um, I know that there might be other questions and we're running out of time, but let me share this one example with you. Recently, um, my daughter came, um, we got in the car and she said, she got in the car and I think you'll think this is funny. She got in the car and she said, 69. And I said, I'm sorry, what? And she was like, 69. And I said, huh, what do you think that means? And she said, it means sexy. And I said, oh, okay. I said, it doesn't actually mean sexy. And she was like, yeah, it does. You know, cause they know everything. Um, and I said, no, it doesn't mean sexy. And she's like, yes, it does. And I said, it doesn't. Would you like me to tell you what it means? I said, it does have to do with sexuality or sexual behavior though, which by the way, for her, she wants nothing to do with that. So as I had predicted, she was like, no, I don't want to talk about it. But I had told her right in the moment, that's not what that means. Would you like me to tell you? She did not. And then a couple of days later, she came and she was like, fine, I want you to tell me. Right. And I said, okay. So then we're able to talk about it. Now she's older, she's 10, right? So she's a little bit older, but that was her way of saying that she was ready to actually hear that information. But that is a way that we can respond with like, oh, that's misinformation you're getting. I'm not going to like lecture you and correct you and make a big deal about it. I'm just going to say like, oh, that's actually not what that means. I don't know if some of those examples and stories help a little bit. Um, Ellie, is there one other question that maybe we can do? There we go. Um, I think so. Um, I think a really great one was my third grader hasn't started asking really any questions about sex or sexuality. Should I bring it up or just keep waiting? That's a really great question um, to kind of end on today. And then I can also stick around by the way, if people do have other questions, I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes, but I wanna be mindful of our time together here. That's a really great question to kind of end things on, because as I said, that this is not an urgent issue for your kids at this age. Raising sexually healthy kids is the priority. And that means thinking about it in this much bigger picture. Having these specific conversations with our kids should happen over time, but that's not an urgent thing to go wake them up tonight and talk about. So what do we do if they're not coming to us? The best thing that we can do is to, and I say, blame me, say like, Hey, I went to this thing from the library the other day and there was this lady and she was talking about like how smart you are and like how much stuff you know. And it made me think, oh my goodness, I still have so much I wanna tell you. 
And I was really thinking about just like your body and babies and how babies are made. And I just feel like there's so much I want to tell you. Can we go for a walk next week? And I want to tell you a little bit more about it. Or you can say like, I want to take you out for a smoothie. And I want to tell you a little bit about it. And if you have questions, great. And if not, that's fine. I recommend giving them advance notice and then giving them again, like a day's notice. Like, oh, hey, tomorrow's the day. I'm going to take you out for a smoothie and we're going to talk. We're giving them notice so that their bodies are not in like a hyper aware kind of like panic mode when this conversation happens. It also gives you time to think through what you want to say. It also, I recommend doing it around an activity because it really gives you a time constraint. When you are done with that smoothie, you are done with the conversation. You do not get to go buy a second smoothie, right? This is just done. If they have more questions, you can say, cool, let's talk more. But you do not get more than that length of that ice cream cone, the length of the walk or the length of that smoothie to talk because we're trying to say anything you need to say about this topic now, we're just gonna introduce it and you can do that in 10 minutes or less, right? And then after that, hopefully it was a positive experience. And then you can say, hey, that was great. I'm so glad I could share some of that with you. Let's do that again in a couple of weeks or in a month. Let's make this a monthly thing or this summer, let's go out and do this again. And we're just starting to set the stage then for the fact that I'm open as a parent to having these conversations and I want you as my child to know that I am going to share this information with you, but we can do it in a way that is not so um, heavy emotionally. I want to say that I am so thankful that you took time out on a Tuesday night here to spend with us and to ask these questions and to learn about raising sexually healthy kids. My goal is that parents just always feel like one step closer to answering some of the questions that their kids have to maybe thinking differently about what this all means. And again, to really think of that big picture of raising sexually healthy kids. We had really good questions tonight. I hope we gave you some really good resources as well. Um, and I don't know, Ellie, if it's okay with you, if you want to kind of formally end things, um, that's great. Otherwise, I'm free to stick around for maybe another five minutes if people have questions after that. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and do my little closing spiel. And then if people want to, if you have to go, I know it's eight o'clock. If you need to go, you can. And then if people do want to stay, we can stay for some extra questions. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today, everyone who is here. And thank you, Dr. Crowett. Um, you shared so much valuable information today. I hope everyone, um, you know, got something out of this and found it helpful in some way, um, you can register for the remaining sessions if you like. I know your kids are just gonna keep getting older, so it's not a bad idea to be prepared for what's coming down the road. Um, it'll be next week and the week after at the exact same time. Um, so you can go onto the library's website, ahml.info, um, and register for those programs as well. Um, in addition, this program itself and all of the other ones will be available for um, a limited time on our AHML YouTube channel. So it was recorded, um, so you can check there and view it again if you want to go back. Um, you're more than welcome to. So I'm going to say good night to those of you who need to go. Thank you again for being here. And um, if you would like to stay, we can take some extra questions. So I did have one. Um, actually in the chat that was shared earlier, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, there were two kind of related ones that were, how would you explain the concept of puberty to this age group? And also how much should we be telling sons about girl stuff and daughters about boy stuff? Uh, very good question. So I'll start with the latter question. So um, for the most part, both boys and girls can know the exact same information about what it means to be a boy or a girl or male or female at this point. Um, they really can know all of the same things. I know that sometimes that's trickier because like, for example, if you just only have boys in your house, it might not seem as natural to them be talking about, you know, girl bodies um, or vice versa. But one of the things that you can absolutely do is just say to your kids like, hey, wow, I just realized we only have boys in this house. And I bet you have lots of questions about girl bodies. And we don't really want our kids, like as a mom, I don't need my kids coming to me and wanting to look at my body for that record. So we can then use some of these books and these resources to help them with that. But yes, they can develop mentally, like they're ready to know both things um, or about, about both genders or all genders. They're ready to know that information. Um, I would say you could get, yeah, encourage them to ask questions about the other one. It's not that you need to shelter them from the other kind of you know information, but if they're not asking those questions, you can kind of wait on that, make sure that they feel really comfortable understanding their own bodies and what their own bodies are doing first. Um, and then you can talk about with one caveat, which will get us into that puberty question. But we wanna make sure that they're understanding kind of what their body parts are called or what they're for first. 
But if you are, for example, you only have boys in your house um, and you are a mom, then just start talking about your body, right? And it's going to sound silly, but if you are getting your period and you need to go change a tampon, then you can just say out loud, I'm going to go to the bathroom and change my tampon. And that is all you need to say. You don't need to explain it, but it's giving them a word that they may or may not have questions about that they may or may not be like, wait, what was that? Right. But as then they get older, those are kind of reference points for you to be able to come back on. Um, and then, the, you know, we can have different conversations if it's, you know, more girls than boys. When it comes to puberty, how to talk to them about it at this age, obviously the big thing that's going to be happening is that their bodies are changing and puberty starts for girls, usually before it does for boys. The average age that it kind of starts for girls is like nine to 11. And it's usually what we'd say like 10 to 13 for starting for boys, but that's an average, right? So that means that we know that some girls are going to be starting earlier. So we want to, that's why it's important to be having some of these conversations now. Those books that I recommended are really great to be able to give like a third grader um, in terms of developmental readiness. Like they can be reading that with you and they'll, that's going to be perfectly appropriate for them. We want to be talking to them about that. You can use the word puberty. You can ask if they've ever heard of the word puberty and you can just say, um, you know, like, hey, have you ever heard of that word puberty? Which, but they will hear about sooner, you know, than later if they haven't. And you can say puberty is this like really cool thing that's going to be happening to your body. We're kind of always framing it as positive, right? But we're saying puberty is this really cool thing that happens. And it's when your body is going to start to change and it's going to start to change from being kind of like a kid to being more like a grown up. And that process takes a couple of years, but there's so many cool things that happen during puberty, right? And you can just leave it at that. And that's like a reference you can say early on. Um, and then you can revisit that and say like, I want to talk to you about some of those cool things. I'm always like, if you hear me speak again, uh, I'll reference probably more next week, but I'm a huge fan of being like strategically spontaneous, I call it, which is like, you know, let's say you're walking down the aisle at Target and you have no reason to go down the tampon aisle, but you're going to go down it because it's going to be a conversation starter. So you're going to be like, weird, weird that we're down this aisle, but like this made me think we probably haven't talked about tampons before or periods. That makes me think we should talk about it, right? So using those things or using a commercial on TV or an ad that might pop up somewhere and being like, oh my gosh, right? And you can look at it in advance, right? I have not, by the way, been, uh, uh, or I will say I have been known to like have a commercial on TV that I'll pause and wait for my kids to come back in the room and then be like, oh, weird that this is on, but it made me think that we should talk about this. Right. So you can be strategically, but spontaneous in some of these conversations. And the idea is that you're getting your kids the information that they need. Um, and then again, when it comes to like what to say about puberty, we are going to talk a lot more about that next week. Um, because we'll say like those fourth graders really should kind of be knowing what they're getting into, but yes, this third grader kind of age, we want to talk a little bit about what it is. So they just want to know that girls' bodies are going to start changing before boys' bodies. Typically, we're going to say that girls are going to start by getting um, their breast development. That's the first thing that they'll notice. For boys, they'll usually notice like a smell it is kind of the first thing. Those, those hormones kind of show up uh, in the form of a smell pretty early on. Then they'll start to notice some body hair. They'll start to notice that their body parts are getting bigger, that their voice changes. And we can kind of just generally talk about those being some of the changes that happen in the body. And then obviously, as we get into it a little bit more specifically, we can. Um, talk about exactly like what is happening and why is it happening and how old will I be approximately when this happens. But I hope that maybe that's just a little bit of information to answer those questions. Yeah, I think that was all the questions that we had. Thank you again for answering those and being on the spot ready to go with them. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And if you're coming next week or the week after, I'll see you then. Otherwise, thanks so much for joining. All right, everyone have a good night.